most indie games struggle with introductions, so I thought we could talk a little bit about some basic techniques you can use to create functional introductions. These aren't world-class techniques, but they have the handy-dandy attribute that anybody can use them, even if you're not a writer. I'm going to show you some basic techniques to create anticipation in your introductions. Most of the time, if an introduction in a video game is bad, it's not because it's poorly written, it's because the dev forgot what an introduction was supposed to do, and kind of got lost in the weeds. It doesn't matter how good your writing is if you're not going the right direction. So what is an introduction supposed to do? Well, I think that everybody will have a slightly different answer for that, but in this video, I think we can say that an introduction is when we make the player want to play the game. It's our hook. This is one of the first things the player sees, so we need to pull them through the rest of the game with it. We get them invested. We're going to do that with anticipation. This is separate from a tutorial, which exists to tell the player how to play the rest of the game. These are completely different topics. Now, they are often interwoven, but they're still different. You might use one and then the other and then the first again and then back to the other, but they are still different topics, and we're not really going to be covering tutorials in this video. We're going to be sticking to introductions and specifically creating anticipation in them. Unfortunately, i got to show you some bad examples first, right? You've built a game, or you're building a game, and to you, it's a super cool idea. There's going to be these cool space battles. The players can customize their fleet and go up against an enemy fleet, and there's all sorts of pew-pew, pew-pew, boom-boom, zoom, zap, 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 cool guy, and the aliens are really awesome looking, and ah, it's going to be great. It's easy to sort of get lost in this fantasy, and this can result in you thinking that the main thing you need to do is get the player into this state as rapidly as possible. But the truth is that this state is not a state. It's an ongoing process, and there is no reaching it. You grow into it. If you think that this is the best part of your game and you want to get the players here as rapidly as possible, you may end up trying to create an introduction that is super, super brief just to get them to the fun part of the game as rapidly as possible. But this won't work. First off, it's not going to work because it's just going to be a long litany of things you need to do, like a text box tutorial crap. But more importantly, the reason you care about these pew pew space battles is because you've worked them out. You spent a lot of time thinking about how they should be. They matter to you because you're involved and invested. The player is not. The player does not care about your pew pew space battles yet. You've got to convince them that they want to care about your pew pew space battles. And this is not going to do it. Similarly, this is not limited to bad tutorials. Maybe you have invented an awesome world, you've got this really cool setting with awesome monsters, and you have these great ideas, and everything is just, just gonna be great. It's gonna be such a magical experience. And to you, in your headspace, the goal of your introduction is to get the player into this cool world as rapidly as possible. Quick, make them understand everything about your cool world and you end up making the same mistake. Your introduction is just a big summary of everything in your world. 10,000 years ago there was a dragon where there were 16 races that fought the dragons, one of them died off, and the 15 remaining races went off into their own little cloisters, and then the 10,000 years passed, and now the dragons are returning, and everybody's got to fight. And it's like, nobody cares. You have not given us a reason to care about this world, you're just summarizing it for us. It's the same exact problem as a tutorial that tells you how to play the game, but not why to bother. This is the most common mistake I see in indie games, and it even goes into some fairly large games too. If you're not making the player care, you're really wasting everybody's time. A summary is not going to make them care. The worst part is, the elements of that summary that you're using could be very, very powerful in the early game. 
but because you've wasted them on your summary, you've completely squandered them. There's almost never a reason to summarize your world. It's almost always better to let the player discover those facts later on, and instead build the anticipation that those facts exist. So let's talk a little bit about the techniques you might use to actually do that. By far the most basic technique is the flash forward. Everybody can use a flash forward. The basic idea is that you show something that happens in the game much later at the beginning. This is one of the most basic techniques and it is used basically everywhere in every genre. Oh, are you going to have an awesome dragon attack in the third chapter? Well, guess what? You can show that dragon attack and then say, eight months earlier. Oh, are you going to, you know, have this situation where there's a huge typhoon that's going to sweep away the town because you just love your girlfriend too much? You show the huge typhoon and you show your character going, oh my god, what's happening to the town? And then you say, ah, oh, it was just a dream, a dream of the future. This sort of technique works well mechanically as well. You can flash forward to a cool battle that's going to happen in the late game and give the player control over a massive fleet or a special ops team or whatever. And then at the end you say, two years earlier, and you whip them off into the beginning of the game and they now anticipate the fact that they're going to be able to do these things and see these things because they did them and they saw them. This approach is a little bit weak because it doesn't really build anticipation for a full arc. It only builds anticipation for the one thing you showed them, rather than for the whole journey to get there. But it's still very powerful and very easy to implement, and it's used by so many, so many games, and uh, it usually works pretty well. A variant of this is when you flash forward, but not in time. You only flash forward in terms of gameplay. And what I mean by that is you would start the player off as some kind of uber cool superhero with all of their end game stats and tricks and stuff like that. And uh, they get to fight off monsters and stuff while they're the super cool dude. This is also very common. And then of course they lose all of that gear. This happens in Castlevania, in Dragon's Dogma. It happens in a lot of games where they'll give you a sampler that's not really a flash forward but shows you the mechanics that are going to be available to you in the mid-game. This also works quite well, but again, it doesn't really create an anticipation for the full arc of the journey. It's pretty much limited to anticipating that you'll eventually be able to get back your huge demon wings or whatever. Beautiful demon wings. So, what are some alternatives? If the flash forward isn't the most powerful tool in our tool belt, what is? Well, I mean, none of these are the most powerful tools that are possible. You know, uh, someone who's actually a pro writer would be able to use a lot more nuanced techniques. But when it comes to hammers, there are some smaller ones that we can use in a more nuanced manner. One of the things that we're going to want to do is build the anticipation for the overall journey rather than just for one particular thing. And the easiest way to do that is to give the player a place to stand and point them at the horizon. This is obviously kind of a metaphor, but it's going to be a little bit different for every game. The basic idea is that you need to show the player who they are where they are, and where they're going to go next. I'll give you an example. That space game that we posited earlier where we have fleets of spaceships fighting fleets of spaceships, how can we make this work without a flash forward in a more nuanced way? Well, we could show a battle between two fleets, and one of the fleets is getting their butt absolutely kicked, and the other fleet is dominating. This really sets up the fact that there will be space battles. But it's just like a 10 second segment. It's not really showing you actual gameplay or anything. And then one of the teams is wiped out in huge rolling explosions. And uh, uh, Captain Sadface of the SS on fire and about to explode calls home and says, 
No, we couldn't do it. The enemy is too powerful. There's no one left. And then Captain Sadface looks directly into the camera and says, Except for you, the last admiral. Cheesy, but this is the basic idea. Now the player knows who they are and what their goal is, and they're looking forward to the entire arc of this story. They know that they're going to have to build up their fleet. They know that they're on the back foot. They're they're definitely uh, the underdog here. They know that most of their allies are going to be dead already. They know how this is going to unfold at least a little bit, and they're looking forward to the entire arc of building themselves up back into a powerhouse and taking out the enemy. Now, this would be an introduction that would be suitable for a game that doesn't really have a story, and it's just like a map that you conquer. But if we wanted to have a game, a version of this game, which had, you know, individual levels that were carefully built and had a story attached to it, we could do the exact same thing, except for in this battle, you would be on one of these ships. And, you know, it's the SS fairy tale, and, oh my gosh, it's exploding, it's exploding, and then, out comes a space capsule. It's you escaping the battle, except, oh no, here's the queen's dreadnought. And she's caught you. Dun, dun, dun. And then it cuts to you being in jail or something. And it's like all hands were lost on the on the uh, earther side of that battle. Everybody everybody died, says the news. And you're like, no, I didn't die. I've got to escape. No one's coming to rescue me. Those sorts of things are it's basically the same approach. But what you're doing is you're diving in a lot deeper. You're creating a much more uh, wide-scaled and personal sort of, of story. It's not building the exact same anticipation. There's some hints here that the that the story is going to be much more personal, involve a lot more characters like maybe the queen or your cellmates, rather than just being a big tactical battle. In these cases, we need to understand, we need to make the player understand who they are, where they're standing, what their relationship to the world is, and we also need to make sure they understand the arc of their journey. We need to make them understand the direction they're going to be traveling because they should understand the entire arc. They should look forward to that entire arc, not just one particular point on that arc. A great example of this would be the Yakuza series, and this also brings us to another important point because players bring a lot from outside and you don't have to teach them everything. You only have to teach them the things that they have to know that they didn't know before. And Yakuza is a really excellent example of this. Nearly every Yakuza game starts with some kind of Yakuza style moment. The player might be a debt collector or they might be witnessing a debt collection or some other Yakuza related activity. And then of course there is a fight and things go south but not too bad and then everything's fine again. That's a typical Yakuza approach, right? What Yakuza is doing here is they are telling you that you are a Yakuza. That's what you are. That's where you're standing. In the process of doing that, in the process of building that illusion, the player brings in all of their expectations about what a Yakuza story will contain. The Yakuza devs don't have to explain what sort of challenges the Yakuza typically face. The player will be bringing that with them. And this means that the Yakuza team can spend most of their effort on introducing factors, things to anticipate, rather than trying to tell you the basic idea of what kind of story you're in. So yes, you're in a Yakuza story, you know how things are generally going to go. It's sort of like, you know, if you know how to play chess, and someone puts down some chess pieces on a board, you can figure out kind of how this might go because you know how the pieces are going to move. So when you come into Yakuza knowing how Yakuza stories go, the Yakuza team says, all right, you're Yakuza, and you kind of know how that's going to go. So here is your brother. He's helping you to, uh, to collect debts today. And you're like, oh no, is this guy going to die? Is he going to remain loyal to me? Oh, I can't wait to see the burning blood of these two brothers as they stand together. Or maybe they're like, and then all the lights went out or something else, right? Like uh, the fire raged out of control, or maybe right at the end of the introduction, you find a dead body. 
This is not necessarily the inciting incident. We're not talking about writing in, that, in those kinds of terms. This is making sure that the player can see a piece on the board. If all of the lights go out, or if there's a big fire, or if you find a corpse, the player is starting to think ahead. They're starting to think, okay, how is this story going to go? They're starting to anticipate. The reason that the Yakuza devs can get away with this is because they allow the player to bring in all of their genre expectations, and they just run with that. This is something that you need to understand if you're doing a genre clone, like for example a fantasy RPG. What is your introduction going to be in this fantasy RPG? Well, let me tell you what it shouldn't be. Welcome to the Adventurer's Guild. You have registered as a grade F adventurer. The grades are A through F. There is also an S and a double S. You must get herbs for a while and then you can become a grade E adventurer. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Everybody knows that that is the trope at this point. If you show an Adventurer's Guild, all of that is already cemented in their heads. Alternately, you might be like, Oh, we're going to fight. You're going to fight an orc. Ooh, exciting. This is your introduction. You get to fight a giant inflatable dragon, which we're going to call an orc. Yeah, it's an RPG. We know we're going to fight orcs. There's nothing about this that is going to make us anticipate seeing how things are going to go. We don't really get a sense of where we're standing or where we're headed because all we're seeing is genre convention. It would actually be more interesting if you didn't fight the orc. It would be more interesting if the Adventurer's Guild was burned down and abandoned. Because then we start to think, like, okay, well, if we're not attacking the orc, what's our relationship to the orcs? Or, there used to be an Adventurer's Guild, and now there's definitely not. What happened? We're starting to anticipate. We're trying to feel out where this story fits into the RPG genre. And your game has those aspects already. I'm not asking you to write up a new arc for your game, unless your game has absolutely zero story. I'm asking you to look for the pieces of your game that are interesting, the developments that work, and make sure that the player can see that those are coming. You don't necessarily show them. You don't tip your hand if you can avoid it. But you show them that there's something there and that will get them to anticipate how that's going to unfold and where that's going to go. You know that, that RPG that we posited earlier with the cool world with the Dragon War and the 15 races that are all separated and all that jazz? That's an RPG. So how would you make that RPG work with our Brontosaurus dragon here? So my impulse would be to not talk about cities at all, not talk about Dragon Wars at all, not talk about species differences at all. I wouldn't list anything. I would show two elves walking through a field, and then one elf says, we gotta be careful, this is human territory. We've gone too far. And then the other elf could say something like, yeah, but this is where the last dragon fell. We've gotta find those bones. Now we immediately know what's going on here. We've got two elves, presumably one of them is the player character, or at least for the moment, and then we understand that they are not welcome in human territory. They're outside of their comfort zone. They're searching for ancient dragon bones for reasons that we don't know but are clearly extremely important. You start to anticipate. This is much, much more useful than trying to list all of the cool things in your world. Don't summarize. Make the player anticipate instead. Now, I understand that that second technique of putting the player in a place and then, you know, showing them the horizon so they can see the entire arc of their journey at least a little bit, I understand that that is uh, something that takes a little bit of, of writing to do. So if you are a little bit scared of trying that, you could just use the flash forward. I mean, everybody does. It is a staple of every genre, and it works great. That's it.
Let me know if you have any cool, easy-to-use techniques down below.